In growing years, the patient safety and quality improvement questions have become really high yield, frankly, for USMLE and Comlex. There's been a growing emphasis on how do we better improve patient outcomes. And because of this, let's test medical students on patient safety and quality improvement. So 10 years ago, you wouldn't find a single question about this topic. But today and in the future, this is going to be extremely high yield. So let me go through what you really should know. As you'll see from this video, patient safety and quality improvement really requires you to know a bunch of definitions and a bunch of principles. And if you can do that, you'll be able to apply those definitions and principles to almost any question that you get. As a brief overview, medical errors are the third highest cause of death in the United States. So if you are going to be a physician, a PA, an NP, you obviously should care about this. The reason that this does not get as much attention as things like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, is because if somebody dies due to a medical error, it's actually not listed as the cause of death on a person's death certificate. And so therefore, when research is done and public health bodies come together, medical errors really don't get a lot of attention. However, they cost an estimated $20 billion in annual healthcare costs in the United States. And obviously, they have drastic effects on both the patient, but also the provider. It leads to high morbidity, mortality, and economic burden. And because of this slide, test writers like to test you on it. If it's this important, you're going to get test questions on it. So let's start by talking about medical errors. Medical errors refers to a preventable harm to a patient that is the result of either one, a failure of a planned action to be completed as it intended, or two, the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim. So with medical errors, there are two important components. One is that it was preventable, and two is that it caused a harm to an individual. And that preventable harm is the result of either the plan not going as intended or the wrong plan being utilized. And there are lots of different examples of medical errors. They can be broken into various different categories as you see on the slide. Now, most of this is fairly obvious, but let's just run through a couple examples that could show up on your exam. Surgical errors, diagnostic errors, medication errors, systems errors, pharmacy errors, hospital acquired infections or laboratory errors. So surgical errors, for example, would be if the wrong organ is taken out or in even more horrible cases, if the wrong patient gets the wrong surgery. Diagnostic errors, if somebody's given the wrong diagnosis, this is actually quite common, unfortunately. Medication errors, if an inappropriate medication is used. Systems errors. Now, systems errors is kind of a vague term, but this refers to logistical failures in, say, a hospital, a private practice, some type of organization where the system or the logistics through which patients move through that enterprise if that fails. Pharmacy errors, preparation or processing of dispensed medications. If there's an error in that area, that's a pharmacy error. Hospital acquired infections, obviously a huge concern on the part of hospitals. This does show up on exams as well. Hospital acquired pneumonia, surgical site infections, device or catheter associated infections. These are technically medical errors. And then lastly, laboratory errors. If blood is drawn and that blood is read incorrectly and the laboratory data is reported incorrectly, that of course is also a medical error. So these are just some of the types of examples that you could see on your exam. Errors can be active or latent. So an active error results from a healthcare professional who renders patient care. For example, an ICU nurse enters the wrong settings on a ventilator. This is an active error because it was an error as a result of an individual's action. Contrast that with a latent error. In a latent error, there is an intrinsic systems failure. So latent errors are sometimes referred to as, quote, an accident waiting to happen. For example, the ventilator machine stopped working. It wasn't that anybody initiated some type of action that led to the error. It was simply the fact that the system had an intrinsic failure of an existing piece. So active requires action and latent does not. And my mnemonic to memorize the difference here is that in active, there is action.
Now, adverse events, this term is technically a little bit different from medical error. Adverse events can be broken down into various different categories, as you see on the slide. We have negligent adverse events, near miss, never event, noxious episode, potentially compensatable events, and sentinel events. And what's important to know before we go any further is that these definitions are not mutually exclusive. And so as you'll see in just a moment here, something like a negligent adverse event can also technically be a potentially compensatable event. So these definitions can be interchangeable. They're not mutually exclusive. However, they show up on USMLE in Comlex, and so you need to know these definitions. So let's run through them. A negligent adverse event is, as the name implies, an adverse event where negligence is involved. And the legal standard for negligence is that it was the failure of an average healthcare worker to meet the expected standard of care. A near miss is something that could have resulted in patient harm, but didn't. Luckily, it was caught in time. A never event is a medical error that should absolutely never happen. And I think one could argue that medical errors, all of them should never happen. But this is something where when you read it, you conclude that should absolutely never happen. And I'll give you an example on the next slide. A noxious episode is treatment that may cause complications or adverse events, but despite the potential for those adverse events, sometimes that treatment still is initiated. Again, example to be on the next slide. A potentially compensatable event is an adverse event that might lead to a malpractice claim. Again, it's potentially compensatable. And that typically is the result of a negligent adverse event, which is typically the result of something like a never event or some other type of sentinel event. Again, I'm just trying to highlight here that these definitions are interchangeable and they can also be not mutually exclusive. And then lastly, a sentinel event. This is a word that does show up quite often on exams. This is an adverse event that involves death, serious physical or psychological injury, or the risk thereof. So let's just kind of go through a couple examples to help shore up some of these definitions. So a near miss is when there was potentially going to be some type of adverse event or medical error, but it was caught in time. And so for example, Let's say there's an example where the wrong medication is ordered by the attending physician, and after that wrong order was placed, the pharmacist, who's doing their double check on all of the orders, realizes that the wrong medication was ordered, and they stopped the wrong order from being given to the patient. So the patient could have gotten some potentially lethal wrong medication, but the pharmacist caught it, and that medication was never dispensed. That's a near miss because in that case, there was almost this adverse event, but it was caught in time. Never event. A patient's left kidney is removed instead of their right kidney. So if someone is supposed to have their right kidney removed and they go under and their left kidney is removed, this is a never event because you see this, you hear about this, and you, you conclude this should absolutely never happen. Again, one could make the argument that medical errors in general should all never happen, but there's a huge difference between a latent error where, let's say, a, an EKG machine runs out of batteries and stops working versus this active error where, with the, or this never event where the patient's wrong organ is taken out. So I hope you can appreciate the difference. A noxious episode, again, this is where there's a potential complication of a treatment, but you still opt for that treatment. So for example, let's say that a trauma patient comes into the emergency room, they're hemodynamically unstable, and you make the decision to send them to get imaging before taking them to the operating room. Of course, in sending them to get imaging, they could bleed out, they could die, they could have all these potential complications from you delaying their going to the operating room, but in your decision making, you determine they need to get imaging first. This is a noxious episode because there's a potential complication or a potential noxious adverse event, but you're still opting to do that anyway. And then a sentinel event, a good example of a sentinel event is a foreign object that is retained following surgery. Again, a sentinel event could be a never event. It could be a negligent adverse event. It could be a potentially compensatable event. 
The point being, and I know I've said it now for the fourth time, is that these terms are not mutually exclusive, but you still need to know these definitions. So these are adverse events. Something that USMLE and Comlex absolutely loves to talk about these days is what's called a root cause analysis or an RCA. So a root cause analysis, in short, seeks to identify causative factors that lead to adverse and sentinel events. When we talk about the root cause, what the root cause refers to is a deficiency that if corrected or avoided would have eliminated the adverse event to begin with. And so typically what happens is that in big health systems and hospitals, root cause analyses are conducted after a medical error takes place. And what's important to know for USMLE and Comlex is one, it seeks to identify the causative factors, and two, it focuses on the systems and the processes that led to the error. It does not focus on individual actions. And that's really high yield because on your exam, you could be given a question and the question will describe an error that took place and then it will say which of the following is the correct way to proceed. And the answer will have something to do with an analysis that focuses on the system or the process. The answer will not be anything having to do with individual actions taken by people that led to the error. And that's really important because in a root cause analysis, you've got this interdisciplinary collaborative group of professionals typically made out of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, case managers, right? You've got everybody together from different disciplines and they're trying to assess how does our system work? What went wrong in our process that led to this error? And they look at lots of different information. What they don't do is say, oh, Dr. Smith did this, that was wrong. So they don't wanna place blame on the individual. They're not looking at an individual's action. They're not looking to punish an individual. Again, the focus of a root cause analysis is looking at the system and the process. And that's really high yield for USMLE and Comlex. Now these RCAs, they are compiled into a detailed report and they get given to the joint commission. For aggregation and the joint commission aggregates all of the root cause analyses. If a hospital fails to conduct a root cause analysis within 45 days of an event, they're placed on what's known as an accreditation watch. And if they don't correct that, the joint commission could rescind their accreditation. So it's kind of a big deal. Typically, a root cause analysis looks something like this. Again, a group of collaborative interdisciplinary professionals made up of various people from the hospital or the health system come together, they identify the problem, they look at data, they analyze that data, they talk about potential solutions to refine the system or refine the process, and then they put those changes into effect and monitor the effectiveness moving forward. Now, as a result of root cause analyses, we can see some examples of solutions to historical adverse events or medical errors. So for wrong site surgeries or surgical errors, now you have that preoperative verification and reconciliation, marking the site on the patient's body and doing the time out. For hospital acquired infections, there's been a huge push over the past 50 years for hand hygiene, catheter site selection, and constantly assessing the need for the removal of lines. So these are just some examples of changes that have been implemented as a result of root cause analyses. Now let's switch gear and talk about medication errors. Medication errors are also a, a fairly high yield topic for USMLE and Comlex. And you really just need to know some definitions here. So there are different types of medication errors. There are action-based medication errors, rule-based medication errors, and memory-based medication errors. An action-based medication error, like the name implies, required an action of an individual. So for example, an attending physician selects the wrong dose or selects the wrong medication. In a rule-based medication error, the rule with which you prescribe the medication or administer the medication was done incorrectly. So giving the medication incorrectly. And then lastly, memory-based. This is not remembering some aspect unique to the patient's care and because of that, there was an error. So for example, you give a patient a medication they're allergic to because you don't remember that they're allergic to it. Moving on, there are other types of medication errors. There are general knowledge-based medication errors. There are specific knowledge-based medication errors. 
and there are expert knowledge-based medication errors. So in other words, there are varying degrees to which specific or expert level information is required to avoid a medication error. So in a general knowledge-based one, for example, warfarin may cause bleeding. You need to know that in general when you prescribe warfarin. And so if somebody is at risk for bleeding and you give them warfarin and you didn't know that it causes bleeding, there was a lapse in your general knowledge. Specific knowledge is a little more, as the name implies, specific. So in this case, for example, if you give somebody warfarin despite them having a high INR, you may know in general that warfarin causes bleeding, but specifically you may not understand the nuances of INR. And so if you give somebody warfarin and they have an adverse event, you had a lapse in your specific knowledge. So this is one step deeper or one step more detailed. And then there's the most detailed or the most knowledge required, which is an expert knowledge based medication error. And so for example, if you didn't do specific genetic testing to optimize somebody's warfarin, this requires sort of an expert level knowledge on the topic. And so again, you might know that warfarin causes bleeding and you might know that you shouldn't give it if the INR is in a certain range or how to adjust the dose in a certain range. But some people do very specific genetic testing to optimize things. And so in that case, if you didn't do that correctly and there was a medication error involving warfarin, that would be a lapse in your expert knowledge and it would be an expert knowledge based medication error. One way to reduce medication errors is involve pharmacists. This point shows up on USMLE and Comlex a lot. And I should have bolded this and put this in red because this is a big one. Involve the pharmacists. A lot of questions will describe a medical error on your exam and ask you which of the following is the best way to proceed. And a lot of times the answer is going to involve allowing the pharmacist to give their input, give their perspective or talk in the root cause analysis meeting. I don't know why that is, but the test writer loves to remind you that the pharmacist is a key member of the team. Two providers should be verifying medications prior to giving medications using electronic health records and related technologies. So in other words, don't use paper charts. Shift handoffs where you, you know, if the doctor is leaving for the day, Dr. A talks to Dr. B and explains all of the treatment status and medications to the doctor who's coming on to the shift. And then lastly, adhering to the Joint Commission's eight rights of medication administration. Big takeaway here, involve pharmacists, bottom line. This is my last slide. These are some high yield points that I've kind of just put together for you because it's what I've observed to show up on exams the most. So point number one is that most medical errors do not occur due to the actions of one individual. Most medical errors are because of a failure of the system. And for this reason, that's why we do root cause analyses, because we're looking at the system. If there was a medical error, it chances are it wasn't one person's bad decision making. It was a system or a culture that permitted the error to take place. And that's really important because, again, we don't want to blame people. Point number two. Improvements can't be made unless the problems are identified, and therefore, it's so important for a healthcare system to allow the reporting of problems, to conduct RCAs, and to monitor outcomes. Point number three, punishment needs to be avoided. The fear of punishment or the fear of legal consequences is a big reason why people might not report any errors that they made, so you have to remove the barriers to reporting. Punishment should be avoided. Again, we don't focus on the actions of individuals we focus on the system. Number four, kind of already said this, but barriers to reporting errors have to be removed so that the adverse events and the near misses are identified. And then lastly, interdisciplinary groups, including pharmacists, big high yield point, as I talked about on the last slide, have to be involved in quality improvement. It's not just a doctor. It's a doctor, a nurse, a case manager, a pharmacist, an administrator, a legal person, a lot of different people get together and you got to include pharmacists, high yield for USMLE and Comlex. Best of luck.